And so without further ado, let's give it up for our awesome sister, India. Well, hello, everyone. Oh my gosh, this is a full room tonight. We love that. I'm just so grateful to be able to share um, what I have learned in Orlando, um, but we can't start it without a prayer. So please pray with me. Um, hi, God. Thank you so much just for this time to um, just share the things that you have um, just, you know, beaten into me and, and gently instructed me at the same time, God. And I just pray that you um, speak through me, God. Um, just allow me to say anything you want me to say. Um, and I just pray that I can um, really just speak powerfully for you, God. Um, so we love you. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. So um, I, I've had the privilege to be here in Orlando for most of my discipleship. Um, and so, you know, when Sonia asked me uh, to preach about what I have learned here, I was like, from which year? <laughs> what? There's been so much learning in these. I mean, it feels like a lot of years to me. Amen. Y'all eight-year-olds, <laughs> you know, that's a lot. But I'm getting there. Um, but there's been so much that I've learned. I'm also just really excited to see what, you know, I'm going to learn on my new journey, you know. And so when I think of my time in Orlando, I think of the scripture in Psalm 16. And let's turn there. Psalm chapter 16, down in verse 5. And it says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And so, you know, this is honestly my truth. Like, looking around at literally what we have here, you know, what I've had. I've had a beautiful home, right? Beautiful weather, okay? Like, the weather in Florida is pretty awesome. Um, an amazing church with loving disciples, right? I live near the woods where I can watch the sunrise every morning. I can hear the birds singing. Um, I'm 40 minutes away from the ne nearest beach, which is pretty cool. Um, I live 15 minutes away from the beautiful campus that I've been planted on, right, which is full of nature, thousands of people. It's a freedom of speech campus, so we rarely get persecuted. Like, you know, I have family that lives across town here. Um, my parents are only just an hour away, right? Um, these are some of the things that people dream about having, you know? Like, that made me realize that, especially when I went to India, because ain't no blue skies there um, in Delhi because of the pollution, right? And so even just something as simple as looking out and seeing blue skies, it's like, man, that's awesome, you know? And I have all of that, and I've been so grateful for it. You know, I thank God for just these simple things regularly. Um, but I haven't always been that grateful. And, you know, there were usually a few reasons behind my lack of gratitude. And so, you know, how I fought through those battles are what I really want to share tonight. Um, and so point number one is, is your God enough? Is your God enough? And so this question really defined the beginning of my discipleship for the longest time. You know, my whole life I've struggled with the fear of people abandoning me um, and walking out of my life. Being adopted as a child, you know, there was like this constant insecurity that led me to hold people at arm's distance. Um, so when they inevitably did leave, it wouldn't hurt as much. Right. And so in the kingdom, it wasn't exactly beneficial for me to have this mindset. Definitely affected my relationship with disciples, which I'll definitely get into later. But it first affected my relationship with God. Yeah. You know, like, did I really believe that he was enough for me? If everyone else left in life and it was just God and I, would I be happy? Yeah. And so I want to go to Psalms chapter 42. Come on, Psalms 42. And in verse 1, it says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? You know, and this is, this is a really powerful psalm. You know, I love reading this because the mindset this psalmist had towards God, um, I remember the first time I read this, I was like, man, how he love God that much, <laughs> you know? Because I, I knew I didn't feel that way when I first became a disciple. Like, I was excited, and don't get me wrong, I loved God, but was I, like, thirsting for him constantly? I was like, I don't know what that feels like. 
Um, and so the reason why is because I actually cared about people way too much, you know? And so maybe that might have been why God allowed me to experience a lot of transition and change in my discipleship. You know, at three months old, I placed membership in the Tampa church for four months. And that broke my heart, <laughs> you know? All my friends were in Orlando. And I was upset because God could move mountains and can split the Red Sea, but he couldn't keep me in Orlando? Like, come on. Um, and I didn't realize it at the time, but God was trying to show me that he was enough, right? And so fast forward a few months, I started dating, and I started training to be in the ministry, and I'm like, okay, everything's going great, right? I'm back in Orlando. I finally got it. No. <laughs> um, so we broke up because I fell into idolatry, right? Instead of making God enough, I was trying to make my relationship enough. Yeah. So had to go. You destroy the idol, right? Um, and so, you know, at the time, because of that sin, it felt like the world was ending, right? And I really want to ask you today, is God enough in your life? You know, like, God forbid, if your husband died, right? If your children were gone, you know? Um, if the Orlando church was all sent out all over the world, and it was just you, would God still be enough? Would you still be saved? You know, and this is a question that, like, rocked my mind as a young disciple because I knew that my answer at the time was no. Yeah. I, he wouldn't. And that made me insecure and very sad. Right? And so let's go to Mark chapter 1. Come on, come on, Andrea. Come on, Andrea. Mark 1, and verse 35. And it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. You know, um, Mark is one of my favorite books in the Bible. You know, whenever I need comfort, whenever I need to grow my faith, I just go back to Mark, and I just feel like I'm getting a hug from God. I don't know if you guys have a book in the Bible that makes you feel like that, but that's Mark for me, you know? And I love this scripture because I just love this perspective on Jesus, you know? Like, he spent the day in Mark 1 calling his disciples, so pretty much making new friends, right? He cast out a few demons, uh, healed Peter's mother-in-law, just light work, right? Casual things. And the next day, the first person he goes to talk to is God, because God was his safe place. Yeah. You know, the disciples, his friends were looking for him, and he was talking to God, you know. And when something crazy happens, who's the first person you want to talk to? Yeah. You know, like, think about that. I know as a young disciple, like, mine, it, you know, it shifted around. Like, it was Yana at first, and then it was that boyfriend, and then it was this person, and then it was that. But it, it took a while for me to figure out that it should be God, you know. <laughs> Right? Like, it, it clicked after a while. I was like, you know, um, ain't that supposed to be God? <laughs> like, you know, this is a reason why this isn't working out for me. Right? But the question is, where do your friends find you when stuff is going on? You know? And so, like, as I shared before, I really wasn't able to give my heart to God for a while. Like, I had quiet times, but they weren't in-depth as much as they could have been. And it wasn't until I started to journal, thank you, Sonia, um, that I grew deeper with God. Now, I hope you're journaling, sisters, because it really is awesome. Yep, 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 yep. And so I write my journals out like I write it out um, as if I'm talking to God, yep. right? And so I poured my heart into my journal that helped me to start to unlock some of the abandonment walls that I had between God and I. You know, I started to get very emotional, right? And later on, I got the conviction that I probably should get pretty good at praying, too, <laughs> And so I wanted to start praying on campus more often, so I picked this prayer spot, right? It was beautiful. There was plants and birds and a nice breeze. It was vibe. Like a little niche garden in the middle of a building, and I would just go and pray there. And, you know, some disciples in the campus ministry who knew that I would go and pray there would come and find me there, you know? <laughs> so I'd be sitting there with my eyes closed, like just vibing, praying out right in my head to God, open my eyes, and it's a person standing there. <laughs> It'd be, I don't know, like one day it was Caleb, and I was like, amen. <laughs> God guard my heart. <laughs> I'm dating now, though, so amen. He guarded my heart. <laughs> but that was my spot, you know? And, you know, not going to lie, I felt pretty spiritual whenever they found me there, you know? <laughs> but that prayer spot and those prayer times on campus were how I reminded myself that God was enough, you know? Because being on campus, sharing your faith, you know, um, being in studies, like, it's very easy for me to get distracted by those things, by tasks, you know, um, to start to 
try to prove that I am worth being around by those tasks. And so reminding myself to pray is what helps me to go, you know what, this isn't about me. This is about God and this is about saving souls. Yeah. You know, and so in the same way, your times with God are what's going to set the tone for making God enough in your life. You know, like look at Jesus' response to his disciples in Mark 1 when they finally found him. Down in verse 38, Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. You know, and so after this prayer time, which God interrupted, by the way. You know, he was fired up to preach the word. How many of you guys are fired up when your quiet time is interrupted? Yeah, I didn't think so. Me neither. I have to pray again, you know, when I'm like, you don't see me doing my quiet time, you know. But Jesus is like, all right, let's go preach the word. Amen. <laughs> you know, and that's what he did. And this same zeal is going to take over you if you let it. Right. And so take the time to really just examine your hearts tonight to truly find out, is God enough? And if he isn't, what is that thing that you're putting in between that space? Yeah. Point number two is the call to perseverance. Come on. So the call to perseverance, how many of you like to suffer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many of y'all like to feel like everything is falling apart? Yeah, I didn't think so. I don't. Um, it's not my favorite thing in the world, but one thing that we are actually guaranteed in life is suffering. Yeah. Why? <laughs> it's tragic but true. And, you know, one thing I had to learn is how to deal with suffering, you know? Um, I chose perseverance as one of the lessons that I learned here because, honestly, in the world, I really wasn't someone that persevered. Like, I only did things that were easy for me, that I knew I was able to do, you know? And so when everything's got hard or actually required, like, suffering or, you know, anything hard, like, I just quit. I wouldn't do it. I'd be like, nope, I don't want to do that anymore. And I wouldn't complete it. Um, because I don't like to be in pain, one, uh, and I also don't like failing. I don't like people seeing me fail, which is pride, by the way. And so coming into the kingdom, y'all, there ain't no room for that, <laughs> you know? You're going to have to repent of that. And so immediately, I was challenged, challenged in my gentleness, right, and my pride, and in my perseverance, <laughs> because, you know, going to Tampa as a baby Christian, going through a breakup, then continuing to lead, then the list goes on. Like, there were so many things that God challenged me on back to back. And I remember thinking, am I going to get a break? Yeah. <laughs> like, <No>. anything? <laughs> you know? And the thing is, is that I white-knuckled through a lot of those hard patches. When on the inside, you know, I was boiling angry and I was bitter, right? Anybody else relate to that? Like, you just yeah. kind of, like, force yourself to go through it, and you're just like, I just got to make it through this week, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, you know you need to be spiritual, but you don't really want to be spiritual, but you do because God's watching, right? <laughs> but your heart isn't really in there. Just let one more person say one more thing. <laughs> like, yeah, that, that was me. You know, I, I want to say that I was being spiritual, but no, I, I really wasn't. You know, I thought that that, the white knuckling was perseverance, and I was wrong. Um, so let's go to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. In verse 26, and it says, Therefore I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body, and I make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. You know, and this, this scripture made me realize true perseverance goes hand in hand with discipline and submission. You know, like there's a part of us that, you know, doesn't want to do things sometimes. And if you happen to be, you know, battle with rebellious spirit like I do, then it might be a little more often, you know. And I was in ROTC, like Sonia shared, like in high school and in college. You know, I was two months away from signing my life over to the military when I got baptized. And even after baptism, it took some serious conversations for me to choose not to go into the military. I remember talking in Sonia's kitchen and talking in Yana's car. And they're like, don't do it, Indy, <laughs> you know. So don't get me wrong. Like, I know how to follow an order from my commander, right? But did I know how to submit to it? You know, and so this kind of leads to the question of what submission really is, right? And so Ephesians 5.21 says to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, right? In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us to be like-minded. And then Jesus prayed for us to be completely unified in John 20. 
And so through these scriptures, I learned that submission is literally praying until your heart changes to be completely like-minded with the call, right? And that takes suffering. It takes prayer. And it takes digging deep and capturing your thoughts. You know, like there are so many times where I have failed to submit to Sonia in my shame, to Chris, to my co-leaders, because I didn't want to do it. And it didn't work out for me, okay? Not, I'm just, it wasn't like all rainbows. It was rough, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and so where my white knuckling and pride has caused disunity, bitterness, and strife, you know, I had to own that. Even this morning, I was kind of battling out with God, you know, because I didn't want to submit to the call he was expecting from me. I wanted to be stubborn. I wanted to be unyielding. I was tempted to go back to my habit of just white knuckling and false humility, you know. And I'm just being open. Like, these are my true thoughts, you know. But I knew, like, I knew it was not going to help me to go down that path again. And so to choose pride, to choose disunity, to choose arrogance. I can't look God in the face and really tell myself that's what he wanted. I can't look Sonya in the face and say, I'm behind you when I'm not. Can you? And so you want to know what I've been doing all day? I've been praying. (laughs) I prayed with some fired up sisters on the Knoxville mission team. Just, you know, be open with them and start to build relationships. I got to pray with my awesome and super spiritual boyfriend. Um, And I prayed alone, you know. And I prayed with Sonia. And I prayed and I prayed until I can get my heart to where it lined up with those scriptures above. And I'm still praying because God knows I'm stubborn, you know. Um, But that's what I have to do. And it doesn't feel good. This morning, I was like, I feel like doo-doo. I don't feel good, God. This doesn't feel good, and I know this is not peace. I should be feeling peace, so that means there's something in my heart that I'm doing wrong, right? It's not something to blame on someone else if I'm the one that's struggling, (laughs) right? And so I prayed, and I'm going to choose to persevere even though it hurts, even though it doesn't feel good, and I'm going to do what I can to be righteous. So do you have this conviction? There are a lot of changes happening soon, right? I'm leaving, right? (laughs) <laughs> it's going to be great, you know, but are you really being open about how you feel about these things? You know, are you making every effort to persevere with your thoughts and choose to submit to God's call in all of this, right? Or are you just going to white knuckle it? Give a small amen, sis, right? You do realize amen means so be it. Yeah. Like it means we're in agreement. Yeah. You know, and I feel like a lot of people use that term, that term, and, you know, they're not really in agreement. I'm like, you're actually kind of lying by saying that, you know. It's a term of submission. A term of submission to God. <laughs> right? And so, you know, I'm just saying, be careful when you're using it. You're not really submitting. <laughs> just saying. I've been guilty of doing that sometimes, too. And then I realize it's like, wait, that's not the move. <laughs> And so I just really want to challenge any of you, if there's any situation, you know, any hesitation in your perseverance to submit, to study out the scriptures and get a biblical conviction on what Jesus expects from you, yeah. not just what people expect. Right. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Point number three, no greater love. Point number three is no greater love. <clears throat> so one of the... I would say the hardest lessons and the one that I cherish the most is the concept of loving people deeply. Um, So holding people at arm's distance kind of seems like the solution to the fear of abandonment until, you know, I look around and there's nobody with me, (laughs) right? And so I kind of kept my heart under lock and key for so long that it took God completely crushing it for me to open up. And I really hope that he doesn't have to do the same to you. I look around Oh, Lord. I look around at the amazing friendships that I have here, right? The amazing women that he's put in my life, and I'm so grateful. You know, you all mean the world to me, and I mean that, you know? Um, and I am sorry to those who have been here for a while who had to deal with my hard heart. Sorry. Um, I can't go through and list what you all mean to me because, one, it will take too long, and we'd probably all be crying. I was low-key crying while typing this, and I'm like, God, please help me to have self-control while preaching. (laughs) Um, But it's good to cry. Um, And, yeah, I just, I'm so grateful for the relationships that I've built here. You know, like, it's been um, a challenge. God has been challenging me to be vulnerable, but he's also challenged me to love unconditionally, to not be critical, (laughs) to not be rebellious, to retrain my thinking. I mean, there's so much there. Um, And I want to go to John 15.
John 15 and verse 7, I mean 13, I'm sorry. John 15 verse 13. And it says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whenever you ask in the name of the father, in my name, the father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. You know, um, Jesus made an ultimate sacrifice for us, suffering, dying on the cross. And he did it with the thought that this is for Josie, my friend. This is for Timmy, my friend. This is for Monse, my friend. Right? He considers us his friends, even though we put him on the cross. And I, I... I wouldn't be able to do that, you know? I struggle to love people when I feel wronged, you know? And so to have that reminder is so convicting, and it shows me how much more I need to grow in my love, you know? And when Jesus said that, you know, you didn't choose me, but I chose you, it kind of reminds me of Amanda and I, you know? Um, You know, I went up to her, and I told her, um, looky here now. (laughs) We're going to be best friends, (laughs) right? And, you know, she was like, eight years old, eight years older than me. (laughs) Every time it just shocks me. (laughs) But um, she was so much older than me. I fought for it, we bumped heads and battled, but she is one of my best friends. And I have many, you know, love you too. And Jesus looked at you and he said, I'm gonna be your friend. And he fought for you and he battled for you, even though, you know, we're like this, you know, we're like, "Uh uh-uh, Jesus, I don't wanna give that up to be your friend, right? Are you fighting him? I know I did, and I lost, praise God. Um, But that's the same thing that Jesus does for us. And even thinking about that today, I was like, man, that just warms my heart, you know, to think that he's literally fighting to be our friend when I put him on the cross, right? And Jesus calls us in John 13, 34 and 35, we know the scripture, to love one another as he has loved us. He loved us so much that he died for us. And can you genuinely say that you will die for everyone in this room? You know, um, tomorrow isn't guaranteed. The campus sisters know I've been saying this for a minute, right? Anyone can be sent out at any time, right? The Spirit's sending me to Knoxville, amen? And I, you know, if you know me, you know this is my dream. And you know, like, it's going to be a challenge for me, I know, to choose to give my heart, which is why I'm trying to do it early while I'm still here, you know, for accountability, right? (laughs) But I'm so excited because it's literally exactly where God wants me to be. And God wants you to be here. And so are you building and loving the people here? You know, I think about OJ and Jalisa, Damien and Evita, Reuven and Eunice, who are moving in. You guys realize they're leaving their relationships in Miami, too. They're going to need an extra hug. They're going to need some extra encouragement. You know, because just like this is a transition for you guys, it's a transition for them. You know, Eunice is 18, bro. Like, she's so young. (laughs) Um, But she's so fired up. She's so awesome. You know, Avita and Damien, like, their story is so cute. Like, they did it in the world. They got baptized. And now they're married. I'm like, ugh. It's people's dream, right? OJ and Jalisa are awesome. And so are you guys going to choose to have a greater love and wrap your arms around them, just like Chris and Sonia have done for us for years? They came here, right? They came here from L.A. They left everything behind. Sonia left her son behind and came here and gave her heart to every single one of us. Are you going to imitate that? Jesus did it for us, you know? And so y'all going to see me. I'm going to be visiting, you know? Just know that. I ain't going nowhere, you know? I'm going to be up there, but I'm going to be, you know, visiting. Um, (laughs) But I'm just, I'm so grateful, you know, to be able to say that, one, I was baptized here and that I was a part of the Orlando Church. And I will carry that with me for the rest of my discipleship. So thank you so much for letting me share.